my goal for today is to provide you with an overview of uh, what we know from research on interventions that have been designed and that are typically used to address the sensory needs or sensory challenges experienced by individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and my assumption underlying the presentation is that as people who are educators, speech language pathologists, behavior consultants, whatever you happen to be, who support people with ASD, we want to deliver and promote practices that are supported by high quality research, that is, that are evidence-based. So this is really about what the research says, and certainly not about every intervention on the planet that has to do with sensory um, issues because we only have an hour and a half and I can't do every intervention on the planet so I've kind of selectively picked the ones that I think are sort of most commonly implemented especially in schools and um, we'll take a look at what the research says about those. Um, now when we talk about the sensory system we really talk about multiple components obviously um, the sensory system has to do with hearing and vision and smelling and tasting tactile vestibular that is balance and equilibrium and the proprioceptive system how we experience our bodies in space and some of these interventions are designed to address one or more than one or the whole conglomerate of those different aspects of the sensory system. Um, I, I want to start out by acknowledging that there's no question but that people with ASD experience sensory input sometimes in a different way than those of us who are neurotypical. Right? Like, that's not the issue today. Do people with ASD have sensory challenges or experience sensory input differently? So this, is, this is not debatable, right? I'm, I mean, I just want to put that on the table as being very clear about that. Um, the issue is what do you do about it, right? And what are the treatments, if you will, that are now in vogue, to commonly used, that are designed to address the sensory issues and what do we know from research about the effectiveness of those treatments? So that's the first thing that's not up for debate is the sensory issues themselves. The second thing that's not up for debate from my perspective is the role of occupational therapy in supporting people with autism spectrum disorder because it's often occupational therapists who are the folks who are sort of managing or recommending or designing the sensory interventions and in fact occupational therapy has a important role to play when it comes to providing supports for individuals with ASD and the Canadian Association for Occupational Therapists position paper that was published in 2008 acknowledges this important role and describes some of the aspects of that um, in these quotes, occupational therapists work with parents and teachers, blah, 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 to provide re reaction, to provide strategies to prevent reactions to sensory experience from limiting daily activities by adapting tasks and environments as well as working with families to teach new skills. Occupational therapists can make a real difference. So there's part of it. In particular, occupational therapy focuses on self-care issues such as feeding, bathing, hygiene, and sleep, which are significant issues and tremendous stressors for the family. That's an important role that OTs have to play. And in the school setting, occupational therapists may adapt classroom tasks and the school environment to promote participation. They can also assist teaching assistants and teachers to understand how they can modify activities to ma maximize the child's participation and reduce behavioral difficulties through the use of environmental supports and structures. These are specific skills that OTs have that that it behooves all of us to be aware of and to capitalize on because after all, they're the experts in these areas, right? Um, so this is not about whether OTs are an important member of the educational team, yada, 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 yada. Of course they are. Um, again, what I really want to focus on is the interventions themselves, not are they necessary? Yes, they, there are interventions that are necessary to help alleviate the sensory symptoms and not are OTs important as part of the team? Yes, of course they are. Yes, of course they are. So let's take a look at the interventions themselves. And I think I'm going to do five or six today, kind of tiptoe through, okay? Um, let's start with uh, sensory integration therapy, or SIT, 
right? In the literature now, this is referred to as SIT. SIT was first proposed in the 1970s by an occupational therapist. Her name is Jean Ayers. And she has this theory that, um, that uh, what happens for many individuals is that the tactile, vestibular, and proprioceptive systems that regulate movement, balance, equilibrium, sensory input, all of that good stuff in the body are dysfunctional. And because of that, people have inappropriate responses to sensory input, difficulty organizing sensory information, and a number of other problems. And um, she proposed an intervention called now AIRS Sensory Integration Therapy as a remedy for this problem of sensory dysregulation. What's important to understand is that the term sensory integration therapy is used at this point in time to describe pretty much everything, right? Like, you know how the thing that you, the little piece of paper you pull out of a box to blow your nose on, most people call a Kleenex? It's not really a Kleenex most of the time, right? Most of the time it's just, it's a tissue, Right? But people call it Kleenex because that's the brand we associate with tissues. Okay, S Sensory integration has kind of become that. Everything is now called sensory integration even when it's not. In fact, sensory integration is a very specific set of procedures that were defined by a bunch of occupational therapists led by Parham and her colleagues in 2011 um, they defined a measure of treatment fidelity, that is, what is sensory integration therapy really, right? And it includes a therapeutic approach that has all of these elements. If any of these elements are missing, it's not SIT. Okay, so child safety, opportunities to obtain various kinds of sensory stimulation, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to read you the list. You can kind of read it to yourself. But this is what sensory integration therapy is, is a treatment approach that encompasses all of these procedures. Okay, if all of these procedures aren't instantiated in what's happening, it's not, it shouldn't be called sensory integration therapy. Okay. That's important to understand because I'm going to distinguish that from what we call a sensory diet. And a sensory diet is not the same as sensory integration therapy because it doesn't have all of these, these, these procedures embedded in it. Okay? Now, Ayers did not originally develop sensory integration therapy for people with autism spectrum disorder. She, in fact, developed it more for kids with cerebral palsy and other kinds of neuromotor um, dysfunctions, but it's certainly been um, applied to kids with autism by Ayers herself in an early study, really a case study, not a research study, that was published in 1980. And now it's a very, very common practice among op occupational therapists who work with individuals with ASD, both in the United States. Um, and in Canada and in Australia. So you see very, very high proportions of OTs in those countries reporting that they use SIT. Now whether they actually use like official SIT or whether they use something that they actually call SIT, you now you understand how I'm making that distinction is kind of debatable, but people say that they use it anyway, right? So it's very, very popular, if you will. The question is, what does the research say about SIT, not in general, but SIT for autism, right? Because that's what we're talking about today. I'm very lucky in that two occupational therapists published uh, a systematic review of SIT research with children in general in 2010. And they looked at all the research that had been done between 1972 and 2007 and consolidated it in that systematic review. They located 27 research studies on SIT, only two of them included with autism, and across those two studies there were only three children with autism in the 27 studies. Three children as of 2007. They rated the study, so we're not even going to look at the 25 studies that didn't include kids with autism. We're only going to look at the two that did. They rated all of the studies according to a very commonly used 
system for rating the quality of research that rates the quality of research according to five levels. Level one is the best kind of research. These are systematic reviews, which is what they did, meta-analyses, which are systematic reviews with statistics embedded in them, and randomized control trials, where a large number of individuals are assigned to two groups. One group gets the treatment, the other group gets either something else or no treatment, and then they're compared. But they're assigned at random. That's the best kind of study. Level two is two groups, but there's no randomization. Level three is one group, and we just test, pre-test, post-test, did the kids change, but there's no control group now. Level four is descriptive studies that include an analysis of the outcomes. So probably a few kids, a little bit of data, maybe a graph in the, in the study, but nothing terribly fancy. And level five are basically case reports or expert opinions. Now, here's what I did with this kid and here's how it happened, but I'm not going to show you any data because I didn't collect any data. That's level five. Okay. Both of the autism studies showed slight positive effects of SIT, but both of them were level four studies. Level four studies in the grand scheme of things in the scientific community are not considered studies that are acceptable to establish something as an evidence-based practice. So level four studies are published and level five studies are published, but it's only level three or above, or for some people only level two or above, that actually count when we're saying, is the re research on this practice strong enough for it to be called an evidence-based practice? And of course, you understand how important that is if you've ever had a serious or you've ever had a family member with a serious illness, right? I mean, I have an aunt right now who has cancer, right? When she went to the cancer center, they didn't say to her, we've got a, we've got a level four study that shows that this medication worked for a few people. And that's what we'd like to give you. That's not what they said. What they said is, we have level one and level two studies that show, in general, with your kind of cancer, this is the best treatment, right? If you had the choice, would you go for a level four or a level one intervention for cancer? Of course you'd go for a level one. It's kind of the same here, right? We're, we're, if we're taking this seriously, then we need to take a look at what does the research say and is the research of a high enough quality to say what it says. So in this study, they, May Benson and um, Kumar certainly established that there is not sufficient research to call SIT for ASD an evidence-based practice. Since 2007, because that's when they quit, that's like six years, seven years ago, fair enough, there have been a couple other studies published um, this one was published in 2007, but they didn't include it because it happened after the cutoff. Um, and they these folks provided uh, treatment, this is a level, another level four study, to four preschool age boys with autism by an OT who had been trained in AIRS SIT and had 12 years of experience, so a very well-trained professional. Um, and they tracked um, what they called undesired behavior, um, and engagement. Engagement was defined as intentional, persistent, active, and focused interaction with the environment, and their data showed little or no difference between the two conditions across the four children. And I'll actually show you what the data looked like so you get an understanding of what I mean when I say the data showed little or no difference. So here's one kid, here's no sit, sit, no sit, sit. You don't see any really dramatic difference in the level of the data for that child, right? Here, this is um, problem behavior, this is engagement. So you can see he was pretty engaged when there was no sit, he was about equally engaged when there was sit, he was actually more engaged with no sit here, if you really want to split the hairs, um, right? Um, here's another kid, again, problem behavior engagement. Here's another kid, problem behavior engagement. Here's another kid, problem behavior engagement. Right? So we see not any dramatic difference, not any measurable visual difference between the two treatments. Another 2007 study was, a, again, a case study, so now a level five study. A four-year-old child with ASD got weekly sit and consultation. Progress was measured with what they called goal attainment scaling. And in fact, this child made progress in a number of areas. 
He was able to complete activity sequences more rapidly. He was participating in age-appropriate vestibular activities. He was able to tolerate new foods, play with peers, so forth and so on. That's great, but SIT wasn't the only thing he was getting over the course of this um, several month study. He was also getting intensive early intervention. He was also getting speech therapy. He was also in a preschool. It's impossible to isolate the effect of SIT because he was the only kid in the study and there's no control group. Okay? The best study so far is the one in 2011 by Pfeiffer and colleagues. This was a randomized control study. This is good, level one. Right? Looking at the effectiveness of SIT versus another intervention that they called a fine motor treatment intervention. There's 37 children, so a larger number of kids, diagnosed with some form of autism. Young kids, 6 to 12. The SIT intervention was airs sit The fine motor treatment involved engaging the children in construction-based activities like drawing and writing and crafts for the same amount of time every day as the sit group was engaged in sit. So if this group got 30 minutes of sit, this group got 30 minutes of, you know, arts and crafts. So they were engaged with an adult, they were using their hands, they were making something, but they weren't getting the full-on sensory integration treatment. Does that make sense? So it, that's important. You have to do equivalent sets across, right? Um, and she found no significant differences between pre and post treatment for either SIT or phone fine motor interventions on any of these measures. Measures of sensory processing, measures of social responsiveness, measures of adaptive behavior. There was no, both groups made progress. There was no difference between the SIT groups and the kids who did arts and crafts for 30 minutes a day. However, the SIT group did display significantly fewer stereotypic behaviors. They were hand flappy less often than the arts and craft group. And both groups demonstrated improvement toward individual goals in fine motor and social emotional area. And the parents of the SIT group, perhaps not surprisingly, because when we rely on parent support reports, this almost always happens, the parents of the SIT group reported that their kids were more improved than the parents of the kids in the fine motor group. But they knew that their kids were in the special SIT group. Right. This is very tip. This is one of the reasons why any parent report data in many research studies is often it's useful. But if that's all we've got is parent report data, it's not enough because parents will almost err in the almost always err in the direction of treatment. Okay. So what we see in this be best study to date is a little bit less, and I don't have the. They didn't have graphs; they had statistics, and I decided I wouldn't bore you with the numbers. Um, but a little bit less um, stereotypic behaviors in the sit group than in the arts and crafts group. Okay, so that's something. That's that's good. A little bit of difference there. Okay, um, but that's it. That's it. Since 2011, there hasn't been a number, another SIT study published. Um, and one study that shows a little bit of a decrease in stereotypic behavior doesn't make SIT an evidence-based practice. And the occupational therapy community itself is saying this to its members. For example, um, this is a quote from an article by uh, Pollock, an, an occupational therapist in the occupa American Occupational Therapy Journal a couple years ago. There's been more effectiveness research conducted on sensory integration therapy than any other intervention in the field of occupational therapy. To date, the evidence of its effectiveness is weak at best. We can, can continue to argue that the support of evidence is limited due to methodological limitations and we can attempt to address these weaknesses in future trials or we can accept that the results are valid and that classical SIT used with the populations that have been studied is not supported by the evidence. That's her challenge to her colleagues in occupational therapy. Right? She closes the article by saying, remember that you're occupational therapist, not sensory integration therapist. Focus first and foremost on the occupations identified by the child and family that are of concern. So there's certainly ongoing research in this area. There are a couple of large US-based studies funded by the National Institutes for, of Health looking at SIT 
in a much larger sample of children, classic SIT, I mean, I, we think that those will probably be released somewhere in 2015, 2016. That could change everything. I mean, because there'll be large-scale randomized control studies. But as of today, and I just checked this morning to make sure I could actually say this, there's really only one well-controlled study. It didn't show change on most of the measures that were used, only stereotypic behavior, and there's really no substantial research evidence for the effectiveness of SIT for kids with ASD. I wish that wasn't true because we need a powerful intervention and this would certainly be one, but as of today, that's not the case. So that's SIT. The other thing that people call SIT that isn't is sensory diet, which is like sitoid. Pseudo neo sit, you know what I mean? Like some elements of sit, but not the whole meal deal, right? So, sensory diet techniques, sensory diet packages typically include two or more procedures that are used in sit, but it's not, you know, the full meal deal. It's not a Big Mac, it's just a, it's just a regular burger. And there has been some research looking at sensory diet as well. So, and here, if they called it SIT, but it's really a sensory diet because it doesn't meet the criteria of Parnum, of Parum, I put it in this section rather than the other one. So I've kind of separated the research into what it really is, not what they called it. Because if you look at what they called it, everybody calls it SIT. D does that make sense? Okay. Um, by the way, I will be happy, I will post these slides on the Circa website and the webcast of this um, presentation will also be on the Circa website so you don't have to frantically take notes and I will also post all, the entire reference list so if you want to go read these studies, you know, go for it. I kind of tried to do that for you but never let it be said that I prevented someone from reading research, that would not be a good <coughs> Um, so, a couple of examples of sensory diet studies. This is, this is one that was done in Turkey in 2008. 30 kids with autism, ages 7 to 11, random assignments, so that's a good thing, assigned to sensory diet plus instruction and um, in a special ed classroom, um, and a control group. That, so, sensory diet plus instruction in special ed versus only instruction in special ed. And the sensory diet included brushing, which we'll talk about in more detail later on, um, and individualized sensory activities for 45 minutes, twice weekly, for 24 sessions. Um, there was improvement on a sensory evaluation form for the sensory diet group, but they were getting a whole bunch of other things as well, including 25 hours a week of special education. So it's not like these kids only got SIT and these kids only got special ed. These kids got SIT plus special ed. These kids got only special ed. Nonetheless, it looks like if you add, it, it's not SIT, sorry, my bad. Um, if you add a sensory diet to ordinary special ed, on this, in this study, the kids did better by adding the sensory diet. So that's, that's good. That's a tick on the sensory diet side. Here's another one, 2009, four boys, they compared, the sensory diet here was swinging on a swing, bouncing on a therapy ball, and the control condition was listening to a story for five minutes before an academic task. So that uh, they either swung on a swing or bounced on a therapy ball, ball or listened to a story for five minutes before they engaged in an academic task. For one child, it didn't matter what he did before the task, there was no difference in performance. For one child, there was better performance after bouncing. And for two children, there was better performance after swinging. Okay, fair enough. Right? Right? Another, another tick for something happened that was favorable for the kids. This is a more recent one. This is only one kid. They compared a sensory diet that consisted of brushing, which again we'll talk about later, plus a therapy ball, plus hammock swinging, plus stretching, to a control condition where the kids, th this child only played with puzzles or played with a ball or 
read a story one-to-one -one with an adult for 10 minutes before one-to-one -one and independent activities. It takes me longer to tell you, what tell you what they did than to tell you what happened. There was no difference between the two treatment con conditions. So for this kid, sensory diet didn't make any difference. This is the most recent one, I think, 2013, 30 kids randomly assigned again. This is good. Group A had five minutes of independent tabletop activities. Then they spent five minutes on a platform swing. Then they spent a second five minute in the activity. Group B did the same, but instead of swinging on a platform swing, they watched a brief movie in between the two tasks. No differences between the two groups on any of the measures and no effect for the swing whatsoever. Right. So and now we have 30 kids randomly assigned. This is 2009. This is a sensory diet intervention to treat self-injurious behavior in a 10-year-old boy. The self-injurious behavior was escape motivated. The sensory diet consisted of a whole bunch of things you can see here. The behavioral intervention consisted of inter interspersed requests, don't make me explain this, it'll take me longer than we have. Um, a very dense schedule of reinforcement for no self-injurious behavior and extinction for self-injurious behavior. This study actually revealed that the frequency of self-injurious behavior increased quite dramatically in the sensory diet condition and decreased in the behavioral condition. And then they stopped the sensory diet, because obviously it was making things worse, switched to the behavioral condition on all of the days, and um, the self-injurious behavior reduced dramatically across all days. So here's a situation where the sensory diet actually made things worse for this kid with dangerous behavior. Okay. They replicated that study in 2011 with four boys, also with self-injurious behavior and other problem behavior. This time, because of criticism of the first study, the sensory diet was designed by an occupational therapist. In the first study, it was not. Individually designed for all the kids. This study included analysis not only of the behaviors of the kids, but they also took saliva samples and analyzed the saliva for cortisol because cortisol is considered an, an, a biological indicator of a person's response to stress. So the more stressed you are, the higher your cortisol levels in your saliva. The less stressed you are, the lower your cortisol levels, right? Um, again, individualized behavioral uh, interventions based on a functional behavior assessment were more effective than the sensory diet, and um, which reduced the problem behaviors to near zero, and there were no differences in the cortisol con levels across the two conditions. So the sensory diet here didn't make things worse, but it was not effective, and there was no indication from the cortisol that the kids were less stressed in the sensory diet condition. That's it for autism and sensory diet. So we do have, you know, a few studies, low-level studies mostly, level, level three, four, right, that suggest that for some kids, some elements of a sensory diet might be useful. Um, we also have an equal number of studies on the other side showing that it, it's not useful, and we've got a couple of studies showing that it actually, well, at least one study that shows that it actually could make things worse. That's really concerning. Um, in a systematic review that, that was conducted in 2011, um, Russell Lang and his colleagues concluded this based on their assessment of the sensory diet and the sensory integration literature. The results were that SIT and sensory diet had no consistently positive effect as a, as a treatment for children with ASD. These findings are in agreement with previous reviews involving individuals with ASD and or other populations said to have sensory integrative dysfunction. Right. So their assessment and the assessment, if you look at the individual studies that they looked at, and they considered several that I didn't include because they're really level five studies that were like one kid and someone told the story of this kid, um, is that at this point in time, there's not sufficient evidence to support sensory diet. As an evidence-based practice, does that mean we never have a sensory diet in place for a kid? I don't know. It certainly means that if we do, we take data, we say, we're going to try this for four weeks, five weeks. We're going to take data, right? We're going to see if it makes a difference. If it starts making things worse, we stop right away. 
Right? If nothing's happening after four or five weeks, we go, gee, maybe this kid's time would be better spent not swinging on a swing or jump, bouncing on a therapy ball. Maybe this kid's time would be better spent doing something else. But if it works, that's terrific. At this point in time, we simply don't know, but we certainly can't consider this an evidence-based practice. Right? It's not something we should be routinely doing for every kid and going, oh, well, we've only been doing it for six months. It hasn't worked yet, but any minute now it's going to start working. <laughs> Well, right? Those are the packages. We've got sensory integration treatment. We've got sensory diet, which is a pack, various packages of different things depending upon the child. Both of these are made up of individual components, right? And I want to talk for the rest of the time about the most commonly used individual components and what we know about those as single components, if you will. Let's start with weighted vests. Weighted vests are vests that have weights in them. Sometimes the weights are in pockets. Sometimes the weights are at the bottom of the vest. Sometimes the weights are in the back of the vest. Right? Um, the idea being that you, that you want the child to have more sensory uh, grounding, if you will, by the weight of the weighted vests. This is part of what's included in SIT and also often included in the sensory diet. Um, and there have been actually, uh, uh, up until 2005, that's how much research we had on weighted vests for autism spectrum disorder. First one was published in 2005. Right, that much. 2005 to now, there have been a number of studies that have been published, so that's terrific. But when I used to teach my classes in 2005, I'd say to my students, I don't know, we don't have any research, right? right? Um, weighted vests have been used and still are used to deal with a number of different behaviors. Everything from stereotypic behavior to increasing attention, self-injurious behavior, other kinds of problems, behaviors like aggression and property destruction and whatever, um, to increase social attention, to increase engagement. I mean, it's kind of all over the place what people measure in weighted vest studies. Here's a study that found positive effects. This is a study in 2001. Five young children with autism, they wore weighted vests during fine motor activities at preschool for two hours, three times a week for two weeks. They were in an ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis Preschool, and for a couple hours every day they wore the weighted vests. Um, when the vests were on them, all five had measurable, slight, but measurable decreases in the number of what they called lookaways in the study, if they were supposed to be attending to a task, they measured literally how many times they looked away, were distracted from the task, and therefore slight increases in the time they spent on task, because if they were looking away less, they were on task more, that makes sense. Um, three of the uh, five kids had fewer self-stimulatory behaviors, so that's good, but you know, these kids were getting 25 hours a week of intensive early ABA-based intervention. So it's hard to say, well, it's only the weighted vest because they were getting other stuff. But fair enough. Let's say they were all getting the ABA-based intervention and they were more on task when they had the weighted vests on. That's terrific. Let's, let's give it a point. Okay? Um, that's the only study published on weighted vests so far that's shown any positive effect at all. Here are the others. No reduction in stereotypic behavior or increased attention on task. Two studies. No increase in, no decrease in self-injurious behavior. One study. No effect on in-seat behavior. Two studies, no improvement in social attention, one study, no changes in engagement or stereotypic behavior, they measured both, one, two, three, four, five studies, no or negative effect, that is problem behavior got worse, um, in three studies. That's it. 
And you can see that these are all pretty recent studies, 2005 and onward. Um, and so far, and many of these studies, I have to tell you, were published in occupational therapy journals done by occupational therapists who fully expected, indeed wanted, to see a reduction in the behaviors that they measured with, with weighted vests. In particular, um, Sandra Hodgetts did these two studies that were published under her name as first author as her doctoral dissertation. And they were good studies. They measured heart rate and behavior and a bunch of things in 10 kids with autism and you know a, one, one kid here and there made a little bit of change but when I say no effect what I really mean is it was a fluke if there was an effect it, the, the norm was nothing happened to, in the right direction with any of the kids one of the studies, only one, Reichout 2009, was not a weighted vest. It was a pressure vest, a vest that you, um, that you pump up, right? But all of the others were various brands of weighted vest studies. 2009, a systematic review, Stevenson and Carter concluded that until such, such time as well-conducted studies can provide replicated evidence to the contrary, weighted vest cannot be recommended for clinical application. The evidence reviewed unequivocally establishes that researchers should have no ethical concerns about withholding this treatment for the purpose of scientifically evaluating the intervention. Now, there haven't been large scale, as in 30, 40 in this group, 30, 40 in a control group, over six months, really well controlled, randomized control trial studies. There have, that hasn't happened yet. Right. It needs to happen. People are working on it. My understanding is that, they, again, 2014, 2015, 2016, we may start seeing some of those. That may change everything. But at this point in time... So why do people use weighted vests? Well, you know, have you heard of the placebo effect? Right? What we know is that when you do something, a third of the time, people will think, think something positive comes from that treatment just because they know that there's a treatment in place. So 33% of the time, people are going to say, oh yeah, that makes a big difference. Right? In fact, in a couple of the studies that I just showed you, um, the data were very clear that the weighted vest didn't show any actual behavior change in the children. But when they asked the teachers or the SEAs, the educational assistants, who were working with those children, after they had told them there was no measurable change in the data, after they showed them the data, when they asked them, will you continue to use the weighted vests, 75% of them said yes. <coughs> because they didn't believe the data. Because people don't necessarily believe data. Right? That's, right? It's like, well, I don't care what the data says, I think it made a difference. Okay. You know, is that a problem? Does it, I mean, does, weighted, does wearing a weighted vest take time away from other educational activities? No, it actually doesn't. If you put a weighted vest on the kid in the beginning of the day, by the end of the day you take it off, you haven't spent any time except the taking on and the putting, uh, the taking off and the putting on, right? But they're expensive. They cost some money. They, you know, they can, I mean, 150 bucks here, 200 bucks there, 300 bucks here, whatever, right? Do, you know, so, you know, is it, a, is it like if we're doing hours and hours of sensory integration with a kid every day and he's not getting other educational programming? No, it's not the same as that. But I think it's important to know that at this point in time, this is not an evidence-based intervention, right? We would all like it to be because it's easy, right? We would all like it to be. I would like it to be because it's easy. Wouldn't that be great? Another intervention that's frequently used is uh, what's called the Will Barger brushing protocol. Okay? So, let me, sh so the protocol was invented by the Will Bargers, Mr. and Mrs., doctor and Mrs., whatever. Um, and it involves brushing the child's extremities and body in a particular way. Using a specific kind of brush, uh, a Clipper Mills brush, which is a foam brush, um, or a TheraPressure brush, which is a very soft bristle brush. Right? So this does not hurt. It's not, you're not like, you know, right? 
a specific kind of brush with a specific amount of pressure and fluency in strokes. So there's a particular way that this is done. And the brushing is then followed up with joint compressions. Monica, can I? Okay, so, yeah. So after I brush, I do some compressions at the joints, key joints, upper and lower extremities. And the protocol is d supposed to be administered every 90 to, every hour and a half to two hours throughout the day. So now we're actually taking time out of other activities to do five or ten minutes of brushing. <coughs> the first study with ASD was done in 2007. So before that, no research. It's published in 2007. Kimball, 2007. Four kids. Uh, two, two of them had autism and were five years old. Um, they did not do it according to protocol. They did it once weekly. You're supposed to do it every hour and a half to two hours a day. So they, they screwed up big time there. Um, for four weeks during therapy sessions. So the OT is the only one who did it, and she did it when he, they, she saw him. Um, they measured problem behavior and also um, cortisol levels in the saliva, and perhaps not surprisingly, given that they didn't do it according to protocol, there were no changes in problem behavior, no changes in responses to sensory events. One child's cortisol level went up, right? He was more stressed. One child had decreased cortisol, right? So, but there were no behavior changes, just cortisol changes. And they concluded that until there's more research, OT should take care in using the protocols and should systematically observe and document the behavioral changes they see in their clients. So, fair enough. But again, they, they didn't do it according to protocol, okay? Um, these guys did, in 2011, Davis and colleagues, uh, uh, one boy, so not a big study, but they did do it according to protocol, and again, if you look at the graph, you can see no brushing, brushing, no brushing, brushing, actually, uh, no brushing, brushing, brushing again, and then no brushing, and this is stereotypic behavior, so if you want to look at the graph carefully, you could say he did better when they weren't brushing him, because this is the lowest set of data of all, right? So it didn't work. Uh, here's 2012, Benson and colleagues, again, very, very much according to the protocol. They compared the Wilbarger protocol, the one I just showed you, with a sort of sloppy version of it, if you will. They compared two versions of the protocol, the official protocol and a sort of, you know, we'll brush him, but we're not going to do it exactly the way the Wilbarger say we should do it. Uh, two five-year-olds. Wilbarger was done, again, every 90 to 120 minutes, non-specific brushing. The other one was done once a day when the child was agitated or when the child asked to be brushed. Um, this boy showed really no improvement, no measurable improvement in any of the behaviors that they measured. The boy who um, they did it wrong with, right, showed actually a little bit more improvement on a measure called the um, school function assessment instrument. The problem with this study is that the same OT who did the brushing also administered the instrument, and the instrument requires someone to rate a bunch of behaviors on a scale of one to five. The likelihood that she could do that in an objective way is probably kind of low, because she knew what she wanted to work better, okay? Which isn't, I mean, you know, it's just a human thing. It's not about this particular researcher. It's the way any of us would behave if, if we were doing it. If, she, if someone else had done the rating, so it was arm's length rating, you could believe the results a little bit more. But even at that, it's not like the results were terribly impressive. And both of the kids got multiple other interventions over the course of the study. So it's not a particularly strong one. The most recent one that I found was 2013. Five kids, um, four had autism, um, six weeks at home, a uh, brushing protocol every two hours, plus sensory diet activities, and they didn't tell us in the study what the sensory diet activities were, which is too bad. So this wasn't just brushing. 
Um, they did a sensory profile, which is a parent report measure, and a goal attainment scaling assessment, which is an assessment that the therapist does on a regular basis to examine you know, at, at what level of goal meeting is the child. Um, uh, one child refused the brushing intervention completely, didn't want it. Um, the sensory profile subscales did improve in the areas that measure sensitivity and avoiding. But again, these were by parent report, which is not always as objective as you would wish it would be. And the goal attainment scaling showed that several individual goals were achieved, but these kids were getting multiple other interventions. So whether the goals were achieved because of the brushing or whether they were achieved because of the other interventions the children were getting, it's not possible to say. The other thing is, of course, with brushing, every hour and a half or two hours, the parent or the therapist or whoever's doing it spends a few minutes of one-to-one -one time with the child, which the child may not get at any other time, right? So one of the things that hasn't been done yet, sadly, with the brushing work is what if you just every hour and a half or two hours spend, spend five minutes with the kid one-to-one? -one. Don't brush him, just engage him. Would that have, because then you could separate the effect of the brushing versus the effect of the attention. Does that make sense? Right? But nobody's done that study yet. Seven kids with autism in brushing studies and no consistent positive outcomes at all. Seven kids. And none of them high quality studies. No randomized control trials, no. Right? So again, in a systematic review, these authors concluded a lack of high quality evidence currently exists to support or refute the use of the Wilbarger protocol. The grade of recommendation suggests that the protocol should be applied with caution. Right? These, this is in an occupation, these are occupational therapists talking about their own research. Right? I mean, to be, you know, the occupational therapy community is very concerned in the research literature, you can hear that in some of these quotes that I've pulled out about the overuse of these procedures without the fact that they have, in the absence of evidence-based support, right? So, you know, I know kids who, I know a young, I know a teenager who's been brushed now every hour and a half or two hours for two and a half years for self-injurious behavior. The self-injurious behavior has gotten worse during that period of time, but they won't stop because that's what we do, is we brush him. We don't, maybe, it's, maybe if we stop the self-injurious behavior, we'll get even more worse. Do, do, do you see the problem here? Right? We, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. So what the, what the occupational therapists are saying is, look, we don't, it doesn't look like brushing, you know, is a very powerful intervention, but if you're going to try it, try it for a short period of time, take data, Right? And after that period of time, if nothing's happening, just stop. Don't put more energy into this, right? Because we don't have the research right now to know for sure that this is a worthwhile way to spend our time. Massage or touch pressure. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because there really hasn't been any work done that I could find since the systematic review was published in 2011, and Lee did my work for me, um, he basic, this is a study that looked at all the research up through 2010, only included level three or above studies, so none of the level four or five. Only six were at level three or above. They looked at 132 studies. Only six of them were at level three or above. And here's what they concluded. Uncontrolled observation studies, case studies, and qualitative studies suggest that massage improves the symptoms of autism. However, these data are highly susceptible to bias and hence provide little useful information on the value of massage as a therapeutic intervention. Similarly, our systematic review provides limited evidence for the effectiveness of massage as a symptomatic treatment of autism. However, the risk of bias in the primary data is high and firm conclusions not be, cannot be drawn. So they kind of pulled their punches at the end here. But basically what they're saying is that the research up until that time showed... Now, as a, as a, as a treatment for autism, as a treatment for autism, right, when you measure the core symptoms of autism, 
is massage a pleasurable event for most of us? Do we relax after we've had a massage? Does our body feel better? This isn't about does massage feel good. This is does it change behavior that's related to some of the core symptoms of autism. So massage is one thing. Changing core symptoms is another thing, right? Feeling better is is always a ter- I mean, I feel better after I've had a pint of haagen <laughs> That doesn't mean that it's changing my behavior, right? Right? I feel better after massage too. I love massage, right? I get massage on a regular basis, but it doesn't change behaviors, right? So I think it's important to understand. Nobody's saying massage is bad. The question is, does it, is it a treatment for autism? There's also a study that I just found. Um, again, I always try to update this presentation before I do it every time because I think, oh gosh, maybe something new came out. This one did. Um, This is a study from 2013 looking at deep pressure activities like swaddling kids in a blanket and so forth and so on um, that were in three kids with autism. And um, what they demonstrated in this study, which uh, again, I don't have time to go through it in detail, but they demonstrated experimentally that contingent deep pressure, that is deep pressure contingent on problem behavior, actually made the problem behavior worse because it acted as a positive reinforcement for these kids. So if kids had a meltdown, and then we go, oh my god, oh my god, he's all dysregulated, we need to swaddle him or wrap him or, you know, whatever, it actually increased the frequency of problem behavior because these kids so enjoyed the deep pressure that they started to connect. Oh, if I have problem behavior, they'll give me deep pressure, right? A follow, B follows A, right? Right? So, so some of the, so the issue that these authors raise is the issue of timing, right? That it's not just about what we do, it's also about what, when we do it. And this is very problematic in schools. I see this happening all the time now, right? The kid has a meltdown and we go, oh my God, oh my God. We need to put them in the sensory room. We'll talk about sensory rooms in just a minute. You know, we need to do this, we need to do that because he needs to be calmed down. But he likes what we do to calm him down. And he makes the connection between if I have a meltdown, I get access to this pleasurable event and now all of a sudden the meltdowns are increasing because that's the only way he gets access to the pleasurable event. Does that make sense? So it's not just what we do, it's also the timing of when we do it. Right? The timing of when we do it. And it's very deceptive because, of course, if he has a meltdown and now I wrap him in bandages, which he happens to love, or give him some kind of deep pressure or, I don't know, whatever activity that he loves, he will calm down. Right? He will calm down. Right? So I'm the teacher now, and I'd say, oh, he was all dysregulated. I did whatever it is that I did. Now he's calm. His being calm reinforces me for doing what I did. Do you understand? Right? Right? So the next time he melts down, I'm going to do that again. But what I don't know, if unless I have data, is is he melting down more often to get this thing that I'm giving him? Right? So we need to pay attention to that. Because these authors pointed out occupational therapists who design sensory diets should be made aware of the potential reinforcing effects that deep pressure activities may have on the behavior it follows. Clinicians should be careful that deep pressure activities are not provided contingent upon problem behavior. In addition, parents and clinicians may need to refrain from using activities such as hugging or swaddling to calm or redirect an an individual who's engaging in problem behavior. Activities like those used in this study may have an immediate abative effect, that means they'll stop the problem behavior, but in the future the individual might be more likely to engage in the same problem behavior. So they very clearly showed in this study that that's a, something we need to be aware of. And remember that study I showed you a while back, the sensory integration therapy with this kid who was self-injurious and it made the self-injurious behavior wor- worse? If you read the study, that 
the self in, so the sit was contingent on self injurious behavior. He'd start hitting himself, and they'd start doing sit interventions, right? Which did calm him down, but also made him hit himself, initiate the hitting more often to get the sit. So, timing is as much is is a big issue here for these kids. So right now, there's just no well-controlled studies around massage, touch therapy, that kind of stuff. It just doesn't exist. And so we need to be really, really careful about using it as a treatment. Right? We, we may be able to use it as a reinforcer. Right? I mean, finish your math, I'll give you a shoulder rub. I'm all over it. Right? But you're, having, you're being dysregulated, I'll give you a shoulder rub. Rug runs this danger. D does that make sense? Okay. Sensory rooms. So, um, the, some people call these snoozelin rooms. Snoozelin is a Dutch word um, first used in 1975 that's kind of a conglomeration of two Dutch words snufflin, meaning to seek out or to explore, and dozelin, meaning to relax or be in a wonderful place. So the inventors of snoozelin rooms put those two Dutch words together and came up with that term. And basically, a snoozelin room is a room that contains um, tactile, smell, visual, uh, proprioce various kinds of sensory experiences, if you will. And from the Snoozelin website, they're designed to facilitate increased awareness, environmental exploration, yada, yada, yada. Right? Um, in North America, most people, I'm, I mean, I've certainly been in a few hospital settings. I was at Bloorview um, Children's Hospital in Toronto a couple months ago. They have an official Snoozelin room, but most people here just refer to them as sensory rooms and um, and um, they're not usually equipped with official snoozelin equipment if you want to an official snoozelin room it will cost you upwards of ten to fifteen thousand dollars because you have official snoozelin snuff stuff in it go on the internet google snoozelin you'll find the snoozelin website right? most sensory rooms don't have official stuff They'll have a beanbag chair and music and lights and things you can touch and maybe a rocking chair and, you know, like sensory things, right? Sen things that, right? Well, here's a st uh, meta-analysis, which is like a systematic review with statistics, um, up to 2004, so I'm not going to go before that. Um, and these guys concluded that the accumulating evidence provides only preliminary support that the assumption that the snooze loan could be used as a therapeutic milieu to enhance adaptive behaviors of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities when applied as an individual intervention. In other words, up to 2004, there wasn't any good research evidence for support of a snooze loan room. Um, the, the people um, with whom snooze loan had been used, though, up up until then, and really most of the research is congruent with that even today, are institutionalized adults with severe to profound mental retardation. There are no studies on the use of sensory rooms or snoozel in rooms in autism. Zero. Zero. Okay? We're talking about institutionalized, profoundly intellectually disabled adults. Uh, let me, and there are a number of studies, and it's very equivocal among that population. Very equivocal. Let me show you a, 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 couple, of, a couple of examples. So here's one from 2001 for institutionalized adults. One had autism, which is why I included it in this talk, because every now and then there is somebody with autism, although it's not mostly autism. Okay. So Carlos, age 55, institutionalized, also labeled with profound intellectual disabilities, had autism. And they measured stereotypic behavior and engagement um, in the snoozelin room during a 20-minute exposure session and also in the living room of the unit on the institutional grounds where Carlos and his roommates lived um, before and after. So they measure his behavior in the living room he for 20 minutes, measure his behavior in the snoozelin room for 20 minutes, and then measure his behavior in the living room 
for 20 minutes after he was in the snooze zone room, the question they're trying to answer with the last measurement is, well, if there's a behavioral effect in the snooze zone room, does it generalize or do we now have to keep him in the snooze zone room for the rest of his life in order to get that effect? Does, does that make sense? So that's, that's basically the question they're trying to answer. So, okay, fair enough. I'm just going to show you Carlos. I'm not going to show you the other three guys. So they measured um, rocking, and you can, so, uh, let's see, um, the, the open squares are snoozling, the black dots are before snoozling, and the open circles are after snoozling, okay? And you can see that rocking, this is rocking, and it's kind of a mishmash. I mean, you don't see any real pattern that it, improved during snoozeland, certainly didn't, maybe a little bit of improvement here in snoozeland, but once he came out of snoozeland, the rocking went back up again. You can see that with the open dots. This is mouthing, and it's really a mishmash. See here, you know, kind of hand mouthing, or mouthing inappropriate objects. That's a real mishmash. But here's engagement, okay? Here's engagement. Good old Carlos in snoozeland, Way more engagement because he would be with he would they don't you don't put somebody in a snoozling room by themselves somebody's in there with them right this isn't time out this is a th therapy right so when people go into these rooms someone's supposed to be with them and look he's way more engaged in the snoozling room than he is either before or after so the bad news is it doesn't generalize but at least when he's in the snoozling room he seems much more engaged so cool. So they went, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. Um, let's see if it's really the snoozling or not. So they did a second experiment. And this time they compared his behaviors in the snoozling room and when he went for a walk with the same person who was with him in the snoozling room, on the grounds of the institution for 20 minutes. So he'd be 20 minutes in the snoozling room with Monica, and then at other times he'd go for a walk with Monica for 20 minutes. Same person, diff two different activities, one to one, right? And again, they did observations in the snoozling, during the outdoor activity, and in the living room. And what they found is that the rocking was least when he was going for a walk with Monica, here's going for a walk, right? Snoozling, he was mouthing more, and in the living room, he, the, so the going for a walk didn't generalize to the living room, but it, it was lower than in the snoozling. Um, that's rocking. This is mouthing, and again, you see lowest in the snoozling, and here's engagement, and you see engagement highest. I mean, um, lowest in the outdoors. And here you see engagement highest in the outdoors. So the punchline is when you give Carlos an opportunity to engage in an enjoyable activity with an adult, he will be more engaged, mouth less and rock less. And if you make it a functional activity where he gets to go outside and smell the roses, that's even better than if you put him in the $15,000 snoozling room, why would you build a snoozling room when you could just take them for a walk every day? Did you follow those bouncing balls there? And this is, I mean, a number of the studies around snoozling um, and sensory rooms that have been done, again, all with mostly profoundly, severely to profoundly intellectually disabled adults have shown this same thing. Yes, if they're sitting in a living room by themselves with nothing to do and no engagement, there's lots of problem behavior. If you put them in a snoozeling room with someone, there's less problem behavior. But if you have them engaged in a functional, fun, adaptive activity with someone, there's even less problem behavior. So don't leave profoundly in retarded, institutionalized adults alone by themselves if you don't want a lot of problem behavior. Duh. Okay. But we don't know anything about this in terms of the way that snoozeling is applied now 
in most school settings, which is this sensory room business that we're putting kids into. And again, we run the problem with sensory rooms, the same problem we ran before about timing. When do kids go in sensory rooms? Kid has a meltdown. Oh my gosh, he needs to go in the sensory room. <sighs> Beanbag chair, music, oh boy, now I'm calm. Now it's time to come out of the sensory room. How many of you know kids who don't want to leave the sensory room at that point and go back to the classroom, right? Because why would you not prefer to be in the sensory room? Did he calm down there? Yes, of course he calmed down there, but that's not the point. The point is... He can't live in a sensory room. He's not getting education in a sensory room. Right? So uh, timing is part of it, and there's no empirical evidence that it's effective beyond the timing issue anyway. We just don't have the research. Those of you looking for a master's thesis, a doctoral dissertation, a nice project, this is, the, I mean, we really need this research because the sensory room issue, I mean, sensory rooms are rampant. School districts are, every school I know of is spending $10,000 building a sensory room. It's like, really? There's no research. No research. Right? It makes us feel better as teachers or as whoever because at least now we have something that we can do with the kid when he's dysregulated. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's therapeutic. That it's helpful. That it's a treatment. Here's the punchline for Snoozeland slash Century Rooms. All the research has been with institutionalized adults. The results have been very mixed, both for immediate and long term. Mostly in the, it doesn't really have much effect beyond what you would get if you took the guy for a walk. Um, nothing on the effectiveness of Snoozeland Rooms with kids with autism in school settings. And nothing on the effect of non-Snoozeland Sensory Rooms. Right? Like there's not only no, sen no sensory, right? There's no, it's not only not autism, it's like there's no non snoozeling autism research. We don't know. We just don't know. Okay, last thing I want to do is auditory integration training, and then we'll have some time to uh, chat. And I will talk about, okay, if none of these things work, what do we do? Um, so auditory integration training is based on the notion that people with auditory sensitivity, people who have trouble, you know, with loud noises or, I don't know, toilets flushing or blenders or vacuum, you know, whatever, there's, a, there's some auditory, pro and we're going to fix that by doing the auditory integration training. And it requires listening to electronically modified music or sometimes stories read by a parent that and the store the the input is doesn't sound like a voice it sounds more like scratchiness AIT is not so popular these days um, largely because of a review that was done in 2006 um, by Sina and colleagues they reviewed um, uh, a number of randomized control trial studies that were conducted in the late 90s and early 2000s. So good level one studies. Um, six of them with a total across the studies of 171 participants across the age range. Um, and the p participants typically got two 30-minute AIT sessions for 10 days. Three studies showed no change in autism <coughs> symptoms at all. Three studies so showed some improvement, but um, they were v poorly done randomized control studies because this isn't the only treatment that the people in the studies were getting. They were also getting... Frankly, things like sensory diet and brushing and um, um, cognitive behavior therapy and a whole bunch of other things. So it's, not, it's just not possible to say that the AIT made the difference any more than it's possible to say that any of the other things that they were getting m made the difference. Right? <laughs> so, um, and this study came out in 2006 and kind of put the kibosh on AIT. There hasn't been any AIT research that I've been able to find since 2005, since 2006, because pre people kind of went, okay, we've, we, you know. So I mention it here just because it is possible to get it in the Lower Mainland. Some of you may have parents, families who are paying, and it's quite expensive for AIT. And again, it's not an evidence-based treatment at all. Um, and in most places, it, it doesn't continue to be used. What do we do? 
it becomes the issue. And uh, uh, let me spend a couple minutes with that. This is an article from Grace Baranek, who is like the occupational therapy queen in the United States. Um, uh, these are t old recommendations, over 10 years old, but I think they still hold up um, ver very nicely. Um, and she says uh, comprehensive educational programs absolutely should consult with professionals who have ex expertise in sensory motor interventions like occupational therapists, physiotherapists, adaptive physical educators, and so forth. This isn't about OTs as a valuable um, set of professionals, uh, absolutely not. Educational programs should include physical and sensory environments that accommodate the unique, unique, unique sensory processing differences of children with autism, while at the same time embedding developmentally appropriate sensory motor activities. The case she's making is if kids are bothered by fluorescent lights, go to a garage sale and buy a bunch of incandescent lamps for the classroom and turn off the fluorescent lights because if it's going to drive the kid crazy, it's going to drive the kid crazy. Or put a visor on him so that the fluorescent lights don't bother him So now, because now he gets to be the kid in the class who gets to wear a baseball cap so he doesn't get bothered by the flicker. She's talking really here about environmental arrangements and accommodations. Um, when implementing any sensory intervention, one needs to be conservative. Implement for a short time. She's recommending no more than 6 to 12 weeks. Collect data. If you're getting what you want, fine. If you're not getting what you want, stop. Right Now most people are saying try four to six weeks rather than six to 12 weeks. Right? So I'm, it's not about whether there's an issue here. There is an issue. People with autism have different sensory experiences. It's not whether we need to help them accommodate those experiences so that they can live comfortably in the world or in a classroom. It's about whether these indirect treatments, brushing, vests, yada, 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 are the way to do that. The other thing that's happened over the past couple years that I think is very exciting and has huge promise is the people, some researchers have started to reconceptualize the behaviors that we see people, kids especially, with autism engage in that appear to be sensory related. So I see a kid who's very upset and there's been some sensory trigger for that and my react, my, I have two, many ways of interpreting that upset. I can interpret that upset as pain. Pain, right? And if I interpret it as pain, then some of the interventions that uh, we've talked about may make some sense. I want I wanted, I wanted to indirectly decrease the amount of pain he's experiencing. But what if, I, what if I interpret his behavior as fear? As fear, right? If I interpret it as fear, I do a whole other set of interventions. And in, in fact, many people are starting to reconceptualize these as conditioned phobic responses, especially when there's a clear sensory trigger, and treat them as we would treat any other phobia or fear response with systematic desensitization. So for example, um, Bob Cagle and his colleagues use systematic desensitization to treat hypersensitivity to auditory stimuli in three toddlers with autism. One was totally freaked by the sounds of toilet flushing, which you can imagine was created huge problems for her family. One was freaked by the uh, uh, toys with animal sounds, like that see and say thing, you know, right? right? which created problems for him in preschool, and one was upset by either the sound, sight, or mention of vacuum cleaners, blenders, any of those kinds of noises, right? And would have huge meltdowns. And this, th for this kid, it was a real problem because his family really enjoyed, as a family, he had brothers and sisters going to a place called Blenders, which was basically a juice bar, which was, not, which was just down the street, and they couldn't go there. They couldn't even pass by Blenders, the juice bar, bar without this kid having a meltdown because he had so become sensitized to this problem with the sounds. Okay? In another study, they used systematic desensitization to treat food selectivity. 
right? In older kids. So this is a kid who would only eat six foods. This is a kid who would only eat 13 foods. This is a kid who would only eat 13 foods. And you can see most of them were, well, not only was there no fruit, no veggie, no dairy, but most of them were, surprise, you know, chips, right, Fritos, right, you know, hot dogs, processed, highly processed foods, okay? Um, so, as an example, they use systematic desensitization for, uh, for all of these, okay? Here's an example of the systematic desensitization hierarchy they designed for one of the noise kids. This is the toilet kid. Um, they would keep her at a step, they started with the first step, obviously. Toilet is not flushed. She walks past the bathroom door and the door is closed completely until she was able to do that step two to four times and they had a rating scale all the way from totally freaked out to very comfortable. So she had to rate comfortable at least two, to, at least two times, ideally four times, and then they would move to the next step. And you can see the next step, the door is slightly cracked, quarter way open, halfway open, completely open. The toilet's still not flushing. She's just walking past the bathroom door. She wouldn't even do that, okay? Um, finally, it's flushed repeatedly, but she's 75 feet away. That's far away, right? 50 feet, 25, 20, 10, at, inside, but the door is open and then finally inside and the right so they worked her through the hierarchy she had to be comfortable at a step several times in a row before they'd move to the next step and if she was uncomfortable they immediately stopped the trial right they did not make her stay there if she was freaking out they would stop the trial does that make sense Okay, And they did the same thing for the blender kid and the toy animal kid and a similar kind of thing for the food, right? You have, first you have to look at the food, now you have to touch the food, now you have to pick up the food, you have to smell the food, you have to uh, taste the food, you have to taste a teeny little itty bitty bit of the food, a little bit more, a little bit more, right? So that same kind of hierarchy for the food sensitivity, does that make sense? Okay. Um, two days for Lori. Seven days for Jamie, right? Ten weeks for Jeff because they had to get through vacuum blender, mixer, and generalization to the community blenders, but still, I mean, they, it's not like they were spending all day every day doing this. They do a couple of trials a day, right? And for his parents, ten weeks is like nothing, Com right? right? This is the kind of thing that you would ordinarily go, oh, auditory integration training, right? But no, they treated it as fear and we need to help him overcome his fear. The same thing for the food kids. Six new foods, 15 new foods, 16 new foods over a period of several weeks. They followed up for 18 weeks, all three maintained. So this idea of you know, how we treat the sensory problems very much has to do with how we interpret them. Right? How we interpret the behaviors that the kids engage in that tell us they're having a sensory dysregulation. If we interpret it as pain, it's one thing. If we interpret it as, you know, he needs more sensory input, then we have sensory rooms. Right? If we interpret it as fear or other kinds of, you know, it's really escape motivated behavior, then we come up. So we, we need to broaden how we interpret the behaviors that we see that are reactions to these sensory. Now that doesn't mean that on, for, on individual cases there will be individual solutions. I mean Temple Grandin to this day turns her underwear inside out because she doesn't want to feel the seams because they bother her. Good for you Temple. Good taking care of yourself, right? She won't wear anything but, you know, cowboy shirts <laughs> that are made of a certain kind of soft cotton because anything else, this kind of shirt would make her crazy. It's too polyester, right? Good for you, Temple, for taking care of yourself. So, I mean, of course we want to individually accommodate, right? Of course we want to do that. And, but you know, none of that is about these therapies that we use that, as, as of today, and I really did just check this morning, right, to, in the majority don't have good research support. So I think we really need to think about how we spend our time and how we support these kids to get past this very, very difficult problem that they have. Kids and adults around. Now, adults are much more able 
to self-manage, right? Temple knows. I turn my underwear inside out. Right? Nobody has to teach her that. She figured that out on her own. Um, but kids, kids often can't tell us this is bugging me, or I need this, or I need that. So we need to be detectives. And if something's not working, we need to stop doing it. And we need to think up front, do we want to do something that doesn't have good research evidence in the first place? And if we do, we take data, we do it for a short period of time, and we stop if the data aren't changing. We don't say, oh, well, we haven't done it long enough. If it's going to work, it's going to work right away. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.